I'd also like to announce that we are recording today's session, and we do plan um, to mute all the other lines. So if you do have a question, use that uh, chat box that Kelly talked about, and we will unmute periodically to see if there are questions or comments. Um, but we'll go ahead and mute everybody now, and I'll hand it over to Sarah and Gail. Okay, thanks, Melissa and Kelly. This is Sarah Helvey, um, and I'm going to be speaking for the first half or so of the presentation, and uh, Gail will speak for the second half. And I just wanted to thank uh, Kelly and Vicki and uh, others for asking us to present to this group today. I'm really honored to have the opportunity and to collaborate with Gail. Um, and to talk about reasonable efforts, which I think is really at the heart of what we're all trying to do in the juvenile system, to preserve families whenever that's possible, and when that's not possible, to try to move children to permanency as quickly as possible. So today's presentation, as Kelly said, is really an attempt to try to discern from the Nebraska appellate case law what constitutes reasonable efforts. And to say the least, reasonable efforts is an elusive concept, I think. Gail and I were joking that the only thing seem seemingly more difficult than to try to define what is reasonable efforts might be to try to define what's best interest, um, which would be interesting. But we had both decided that if Kelly asked us to do a presentation <laughs> on what is best interest, we're going to say no. <laughs> but this process has been um, interesting, and we hope that we've, I think we've developed some or identified some trends uh, that we'll be sharing with you today. And if you have any questions going through, feel free to use that chat line. Uh, if you haven't played with it before, where it says the chat and there's a little arrow, you select who you want and then you can just type in what you want. Um, and we'll try to answer questions as we go through, so feel free to, to send notes. Great. Uh, so here's a roadmap of our presentation. I'm going to provide a, a very brief overview of state and federal reasonable effort statutes um, and provide a few charts showing some statistics on the Nebraska pellet cases. After providing then a reminder of the stages um, from the Dwayne G case at which reasonable efforts are to be reviewed by the court, I'm going to go through four pre-termination uh, reasonable efforts cases, and then Gail will go through what we know about termination cases and cases addressing case plan compliance. Uh, a few notes about that. The first is that the pre-termination termination uh, distinction is not statutory. That's simply a division of labor and hopefully won't be confusing to you. The statute um, the distinction of statute is that reasonable efforts are required prior to the placement of the juvenile in foster care and to make it possible for the juvenile to safely return home. So please don't be confused by that breakdown of our presentation. And the second note I wanted to mention is what we're not covering. We're not going to cover aggravated circumstances or exceptions to the reasonable efforts requirement. Um, that is, both state and federal statute provide exceptions to the reasonable efforts requirement when the courts made a determination that aggravated circumstances exist for specifically enumerated criminal violations um, and when the parental rights of a sibling have been involuntarily terminated. So um, we're going to just limit the scope of the presentation uh, to focus on what is reasonable efforts. Um, so, so just a quick review, the reasonable efforts requirement is set forth in Nebraska law primarily at 43-283-01 and in federal law in AFSA in Title 40 of the Social Security Act. It's also referenced to varying degrees in different uh, parts of the Nebraska revised statute in the Family Policy Act, in the Termination Statute, and in 43-285, which talks about the court's approval of the case plan. It's also incorporated, as I'll mention, um, in the Duane G case at the various uh, stages in a case in which the courts require to make a reasonable efforts finding. And I also wanted to mention the new Federal Fostering Connections to Success Act, um, which I keep saying new, it was signed into law in October of 2008, um, has a new addition to reasonable efforts, specifically requires that reasonable efforts be made to place siblings removed from their home in the same placement unless the state documents the joint placement would be contrary to the safety or well-being of either of the siblings. If the siblings uh, cannot be jointly placed, DEC requires reasonable efforts to provide for frequent visitation or other ongoing interactions between the siblings, unless it would be contrary to their safety or well-being. Um, and then state law mirrors uh, the language in federal law on reasonable efforts. In order to receive federal 40 funding, states must have an approved plan which sets out the reasonable efforts requirement. Um, so the reasonable efforts requirement at the federal level is achieved through the spending power. I noted there the Souter case, which found that there's no private right of action to enforce the reasonable efforts provision of ACLA, which was a precursor to ASFA. Instead, the United States Supreme Court in that case determined that the available enforcement mechanisms uh, are the federal review process, the CFSR 
process that occurs every few years and the potential loss of federal funds. Um, and so if a no reasonable effort finding is made by the courts and the state loses federal matching funds. So um, the, the judges, you all are, um, you know, very important to the enforcement of reasonable efforts cases in individual cases. Um, in cases involving Indian children in which the Indian Child Welfare Act applies, the appropriate standard is active efforts, not reasonable efforts. You can see there on the left-hand side of the slide that's the statute setting forth in both state and federal law um, the active efforts requirement, the language of the statute there. On the right-hand side is the Walter W. case. In that case, the Nebraska Supreme Court recognized that active efforts is more, requires more than reasonable efforts. It's a heightened standard and noted that at least some efforts must be culturally relevant. Um, but beyond that, the court said that there's no precise formula, that active efforts is determined on a case-by-case -case basis, and that active efforts statute sets out praiseworthy but vague goals for the courts to enforce. Um, and I think the same could probably be said for reasonable efforts. <laughs> no uh, and then I, I guess I just also want to mention that last bullet there. The Supreme Court in Walter W. also um, held that there's not a heightened standard proof for active efforts at termination. Um, it's clear and convincing. Go ahead. Thanks. Okay, um, so we try to have a little bit of fun with this. <laughs> Appleseed every summer as a cadre of law clerks, uh, so I tasked one of them, uh, Pat Reisinger, who is a Seward native now at Georgetown Law School that came back to Nebraska for the summer to work at Appleseed, um, with a project of trying to review a sample of reasonable efforts cases and to try to uh, synthesize any trends in those cases. Our methodology isn't perfect. I have Vicki in the room, the, <laughs> the researcher. Uh, but uh, a little bit about our methodology. Uh, Westlaw brought up 40 Nebraska cases that cited 43-283-01, the reasonable effort statute. We also pulled up all the cases citing 43-292, the termination statute, and there were a bundle of those. Um, we couldn't sort by sub paragraph six, the uh, reasonable efforts ground. So we limited the search to all cases with head notes about reunification plans since 1998 when the post asked about a reasonable efforts requirement was adopted into uh, Nebraska law and we found 11 of those cases that were relevant. So it's not perfect. I saw a bunch of limitations, like we didn't search by just the reasonable efforts because that was in way too many. We're missing places and cases where courts just generally talked about case plan compliance. But we cross-checked and the same cases kept coming up. So I think we've got the bulk of them. Um, and here's a few things that we found. I think this will all be consistent with everyone's experiences. The first trend um, is that of the cases we reviewed, the vast majority were not appealed until the termination stage. Stakes are higher. Parents, by and large, tend to appeal at that point. And so as a result, uh, there's very little appellate case law on what is reasonable efforts early on in a case. And then this slide shows when reasonable efforts is considered on appeal, the reasonable efforts determination of the lower court was most often affirmed. Um, and to break it down a bit further, because this includes a lot of different types of cases, in virtually all of the cases that were affirmed, reasonable efforts was found by the lower court, the parent appealed, and the appellate court agreed with the lower court. In terms of the reversals, uh, in about two-thirds, I think, of those cases, the lower court found no reasonable efforts. So the appellate court's reversal is essentially a determination um, that there should not be further efforts to reunify. There's a few double negatives in there. So basically the trend is, uh, the clear trend is that the appellate courts most often find sufficient evidence of reasonable efforts. Um, and since you're all judges, it looks like with that 75%, you're safe, <laughs> most often affirmed. Um, and then this shows the reasons that appellate courts cited when determining that reasonable efforts failed to correct the conditions under uh, 43292 subparagraph 6 termination. Um, and there's overlap in this chart, so there's typically more than one reason why uh, a parent failed to comply with the case plan. And we were just going through, or Pat was going through, and you know, taking the reasons that the court cited and putting them into categories. And so from the left there, it's independence, the parent didn't have inadequate, had inadequate housing, had employment, financial issues, mental health, substance abuse, missed or inappropriate visits, missed therapy or family support, transportation issues, uh, parenting skills, the parent had engaged in illegal activity or inappropriate uh, associations. And as you can see, some of the most often referenced by the appellate courts were missed therapy, that's the biggie, um, parenting skills, and employment, financial, and inadequate housing. I was trying to analyze that and noticing that the mental health was quite a bit lower than the uh, therapy support. So I wondered, you know, maybe is it more that 
not necessarily the parent has a mental health issue, but that they're um, not getting to therapy for whatever reason to try to improve that condition. But for what that's worth, um, those are a few trends that we were able to identify. Moving now to the case law, uh, as a preliminary matter, I wanted to mention the Duane G case, in which the Nebraska Supreme Court determined that there are four stages in a juvenile case in which reasonable efforts must be reviewed by the court when removing a child from the home, when the court continues an out-of-home placement, when the court reviews, uh, has a review of the juvenile status or permanency uh, planning hearing, and when termination is sought under uh, subparagraph 6 of the termination statute. And in this case, the father filed a motion requesting a separate hearing on whether the state had made reasonable efforts to reunify the children with him. The juvenile court denied the motion and the father appealed. The Court of Appeals overturned that, uh, saying that the, the word shall in 43-283-01 required a hearing. But the Nebraska Supreme Court reversed the Court of Appeals and agreed with the juvenile court. Um, and consider the question of statutory interpretation of the reasonable effort statute. Um, essentially that the plain language, even though the word shall is in there, that 43-283-01 doesn't have an explicit dire a directive granting a parent or any other party a right to a separate hearing um, on reasonable efforts, and that the legislative history of when 43-283-01 was uh, amended or passed in the statute, the same time the legislature amended those four sections uh, directing courts to make findings on reasonable efforts, and so concluded that those were the times that reasonable efforts should be reviewed. And since in the Duane case, the reasonable efforts hearing was being requested outside of those four uh, stages, the Supreme Court affirmed the juvenile court's denial of the, the father's motion. Um, and I just want to note, and maybe if this is a time for parent, uh, folks to, to jump in with questions or comments, um, as a practical matter, what my understanding is that in some jurisdictions, when attorneys file reasonable efforts motions, some courts will hear it that in the context of a review hearing, an upcoming review hearing, or maybe set a separate review hearing, um, in light of this case, um, saying that there should be not a right to a separate hearing. Um, I guess Melissa's going to unmute it. <laughs> Are there any comments about how that's being addressed? We'll call on you. Okay. Who knows. <laughs> we know who's out there. <laughs> um, I guess maybe there's, maybe there's uh, general agreement. Um, can you pop us to the next? Okay. Okay, so next I'm going to go through uh, four primary appellate uh, cases that address reasonable efforts prior to termination. And there were not a lot, there were a few more than these, several of them were procedural. So what I'm going to do, four that I'm going to go through represent really the, the bulk of some of the early uh, cases on reasonable efforts. Um, and the first case is Stephanie H., and this is probably one of the most straightforward cases we have on reasonable efforts early on in the case. In this case, the children were living with the custodial father by virtue of a divorce decree, and the mother saw the children once or twice a month um, through mutually agreed upon visitation. The children were removed from the father and placed with the apartment. A 3A was filed after a report that the father had sexually abused the children. The mother intervened, sought placement, and appealed an order continuing custody with HHS and denying the mother placement. And at the time that the mother intervened, she had obtained custody in the, in the district court uh, and testified that she lived in Omaha and was able to protect the children and provide for, them, for their needs. On appeal, she alleged, among other things, that she was deprived of uh, custody without uh, evidence of her unfitness and that her due process rights were violated and the Court of Appeals agreed and held that the placement of a child with one parent as opposed to another in a divorce action does not constitute an adverse determination of the fitness of a non-custodial parent in that or of another proceeding. Instead, the state had to allege and prove that the non-custodial parents should not have custody of their own children pending adjudication because it would be contrary to the child's welfare. Um, and again, the Court of Appeals review the legislative history of uh, the reasonable effort statute determine that the legislature's view is that children should not be put in foster care unless it's necessary to separate the parent and child for the child's welfare. And in this case, that necessity was never alleged or proven, um, and the Court of Appeals noted that the procedures in this case were at odds with the legislature's mandate requiring reasonable efforts to maintain family integrity. Um, 
And then on the other hand, in the Eighth and M case, the Court of Appeals indicated then that the placement uh, out of state with a non-custodial parent may hinder reasonable efforts with the custodial parent. So in this case, a petition was filed involving Ethan because other children in the home had suffered injuries. This one had a complicated fact family pattern, and so I'm only focusing on how it applies to the uh, to the re this reasonable efforts issue. Um, but after a dispositional hearing, the juvenile court approved a change of placement from Ethan from the home of his paternal grandparents to the home of his biological mother in California, and the father appealed. Uh, among other things, the father argued that the juvenile court erred in approving that change of placement. The decision of the juvenile court in this case flowed, I think, in large part from the fact that the uh, Court, the juvenile court had made a finding that the state didn't have to make reasonable efforts to reunify. It was an aggravated circumstances case, which was overturned by the Court of Appeals. So once the Court of Appeals, I think, overturned that aggravated circumstances and found that reasonable efforts had to be made, uh, the Court of Appeals determined that placement in California with the mother posed a substantial and unnecessary hindrance to efforts to reunify. Um, and the Court of Appeals noted that the record contained information from the California case, uh, divorce action, uh, and there was evidence that the mother had significant mental health issues and had been absent for, for periods of time from the family's life and that Ethan had been cared for by his father. After considering those circumstances, the Court of Appeals concluded that Ethan should be placed in a situation in Nebraska that was conducive to reunification with his father. And so I think there's a number of ways to reconcile those last two cases. They were different procedural stages, different questions were before the court, the facts were sort of in opposite directions uh, on the two cases, and perhaps most importantly, uh, there was evidence of the, uh, the mother's unfitness in the second case, um, which seemed to be primary in the court's analysis. Uh, in the Austin B case, the child was removed from the home as a result of uh, problematic behaviors at school and adjudicated 3B and was living with a grandmother at the time of the case. The department's goal was reunification with the mother and they were working toward that, but the department couldn't approve placement back home with the mother because she, uh, the caseworker was unable to complete a home study because the mother's live-in boyfriend refused to submit to a background check. And at a uh, dispositional hearing, the court found that reasonable efforts had been made and adopted the department's plan for reunification with, a, I think, a specific target date, target date within six months, if that was possible. And the court notified the mother um, that for reunification, she needed to satisfy the conditions of the case plan, including the home study. The mother appealed to continue out of home placement and the adoption of the case plan. The Court of Appeals found it was not in Austin's best interest to be returned to the mother's home without the home study being completed, and also rejected the argument that the juvenile court erred in approving the case plan that went through the um, analysis that juvenile courts have broad discretion to formulate rehabilitation plans, and in order for a court to disapprove, a party must prove by a preponderance. The plan is not in the juvenile's best interest. And the mom's argument was essentially that her boyfriend was concerned that this uh, records would be used against him and that this condition would prevent reunification. The court of the children rejected that and said, you know, the plan was strongly in favor of reunification. And if it didn't happen, it was essentially because the mother failed to get her boyfriend to submit or to find another appropriate residence. And so the court of appeals determined that the juvenile court was clearly within uh, its discretion to accept this case plan with this condition. Okay, and then finally, for my last pre-TBR case, the Teresa P case, in this case, the HHS took custody uh, after I think a 17-year-old reported that her father had given her a black eye. Uh, at the detention hearing, the court entered an order finding that further detention was a matter of immediate and urgent necessity for the protection of the child and found that reasonable efforts had been made to prevent removal. Parents appealed the detention order alleging that there was not sufficient evidence to support the reasonable efforts finding. Um, and this quote from the Court of Appeals upholding the reasonable efforts determination said, although it may at first blush seem absurd to suggest that no effort to eliminate the need for removal uh, may in fact be considered a reasonable effort under the statute, uh, the statute clearly indicates that the juvenile's health and safety are the paramount concern in assessing reasonable efforts. As such, the court's determination that reasonable efforts were made despite the lack of evidence of any effort to return Teresa to the home is not unfounded because in the present case, there is evidence that returning her to the home would have been dangerous to her health and health and well-being. Um, so I don't, I mean, I don't want to leave you with the idea necessarily that no reasonable efforts were upheld as reasonable efforts, but I think the point, uh, you know, it's a, probably a great point to, to end my section on that the health and safety are the, the paramount concern, and that's clearly indicated um, in the statute. 
And then because I think it's sometimes difficult to think of what might constitute a reasonable effort early on in a case, I wanted just to mention um, a list that I'm borrowing from Judge Keyes, who spoke at the Children's Summit, um, suggesting some early reasonable efforts that might be appropriate in individual cases. Um, these haven't been upheld or considered by our appellate courts. So these are just suggestions. But he indicated um, as supporting no reasonable efforts finding to avoid removal, if there's a failure to investigate, if there's a failure to provide appropriate services for a sufficient period of time, if there's a failure to effectively address, create a safety plan, identify relative placements, or explore non-relative placements known to the child, or a failure to, proceed, to seek a protective order prior to removal. Um, so I wanted to leave you with those thoughts. If there, if we want to, I don't know if we want to pause now for any questions or comments. Otherwise, I'll turn it over to Gail to talk about reasonable efforts. Are there any questions anybody has at this point? Hearing none, <laughs> we'll go ahead and go ahead with the second part of it, which is talking about cases uh, that are termination-based. is always when do you have to show reasonable efforts and is it only under sub six that it's necessary to show that reasonable efforts were made and the answer of course is it depends. Um, the two cases that talk about it first are in rate chance J. Uh, I know cases by the facts so I call this the tricks baby case where the dad uh, knew of the child's birth, but because of the child's physical appearance did not believe the child was his, and so did essentially nothing about establishing paternity or doing anything in relation to that child. Of course, mom gets the filing, there's a termination on mom, they start looking for dad, um, and they did a termination based on abandonment on dad. Um, it was a straight abandonment uh, a filing and the court said since it's a term it's an abandonment case you don't need to show reasonable efforts the only time you need to show reasonable efforts is under sub 6 so that seems to be the law and then you read in Ray Aaron, interest of Aaron D um, this was a filing where it was only filed on 15 out of 22 months a sub 7 um, and the court said when where a termination of parental rights is sought solely pursuant to sub 7 Proof that termination is no, nonetheless in the juvenile's best interest will necessarily require clear and convincing evidence of circumstances as compelling and pertinent to a child's best interest as those enumerated in other sections. Um, there's two things to take away from, from that case. Um, one, never file it under sub-7 only, um, and two, the court wants to see that the parent's unfit. Both appellate courts have essentially said we want an unfit parent before we terminate, not just that the child's been in the system and nothing has changed. Um, so give us a little bit more than that. And as long as there's a little bit more than that, the court is much more interested. Then you have in re interest of Brittany S. Um, this one kind of throws in light, and, and this is, a, again, another one where they analyze the case um, they terminated the dad uh, because dad had major depression, had mild mental retardation, possible organic personality disorder, had assault convictions, was a registered sex offender, wasn't necessarily the best looking dad on paper. Um, they, it was filed under sub 5 and a sub 7. Uh, the court only analyzed under sub 7, which it has a high tendency to do. The court of appeals affirmed under sub 7 saying 1522, you don't need to prove anything more. They did not really do an analysis of the best interest, or excuse me, of the reasonable efforts, um, simply said 15, 22, best interest, slam, we're done. So that leads to the conclusion that you know it when you see it. Um, <laughs> I hate to draw the analogy to photography, but that's essentially what it seems to be the test, that you know what reasonable efforts are, you don't need a lot of analysis, you don't need a lot of case law. Um, of the 30 cases that were reviewed post-1998 that um, the law clerk had analyzed for us, um, that cited the sub-6, 14 of those uh, theoretically considered a sub-6 where they did some sort of analysis on, the, on whether or not reasonable efforts were made. 12 of those 14 were affirmed. The two that were not affirmed are the Angelica L. and Constance G. Constance G. is the older case. That was a 1998 case. That is, again, a kind of a unique case in that uh, it was originally filed as a no fault against mom due to her mental health. 
uh, dad came, was also in the picture, but they was not a filing uh, particular to him. Dad appealed the adjudication, and the first constant G said that, uh, no, you have to have something to dad. If you're going to say he can't have the child, then you have to say something's wrong with him, some kind of filing against him. So that appeal was, uh, or that appeal won for dad, and the, the underlying petition was dismissed. As to him, there was then a subsequent filing to him uh, alleging about domestic violence to others as well as the mom of this child, uh, as well as just general anger problems. A plan was made, the department wasn't satisfied with his progress, and a termination was sought. Um, and that's the appeal that's listed there is the 1998 appeal. The opinion doesn't specify under what grounds the termination is, it was discussed um, or what, how it got filed under, but the analysis um, talks about that dad was um, sufficiently compliant with the case plan. He wasn't perfect, but he was generally in agreement or in, in accord with the case plan, wasn't overly excited with the case plan, and they said the termination was not based, it was not in the child's best interest, which is kind of an interesting thing because they, they combine reasonable efforts and best interest, and that happens in a lot of these cases where when they talk about best interest, suddenly we're talking about reasonable efforts and whether or not reasonable efforts were made. If there weren't reasonable efforts, it's not in the child's best interest to terminate. So this kind of starts that line of cases. Um, the other case is Angelica, um, Angelica L. This was the immigration case where all the big name hitters came in on appeal. Um, this was a mom that was in Grand Island, was here uh, illegally. Um, the children were both um, believed to have been born in the United States, so they were United States citizens. Um, it came in because Angelica had medical problems, had RSV that was not being appropriately treated, and that's how she came into the system. Um, because of the filing in the juvenile court, uh, mom was deported to Guatemala. Mom still stayed in the picture. She kept trying to have the children placed with her. We got the consul involved. We, you know, we just did everybody. Um, it ended up that they filed a termination against her um, saying that she failed to correct the conditions in, in 15 out of 22. Um, so they did a, both a sub-6 and a sub-7. In this case, they did not um, slam dunk it on the 15 out of 22. They said, no, there was not reasonable efforts made to this mom. Um, but again, analysis, analysis, did the analysis under best interest um, and said that the court has to, or that the uh, prosecutor has to prove best interest or excuse me, have to prove unfitness in order to get best interest, in order to get a termination. Um, that they said, you know, this mom was trying their best to do. The reports back from Guatemala was that she was an appropriate parent to some older children there, that she had appropriate housing, that she seemed to be willing to work the system, willing to do what she needed to do. It's just that the department didn't do what it needed to do in, in regard to really reasonable efforts. And, oh, sorry, could I just mention, because I think it's interesting when I was working with a law clerk on the case, that shows that, um, you know, 30 cases cited sub-6 and then 14 of those considered, and again, our methodology, we had to make some assumptions here, but I think it shows it's con probably consistent with everyone's experience reading these cases. That distinction is because parents will, you know, allege an assignment of error under sub-6, but then the courts, appellate court will only have to find one ground, will often go to the sub-7. So that's what this six generally look like on that. Uh, also interesting to know is the in rate type that this case held that any challenge to the reasonableness of the plan has to be raised before termination. So makes the argument at least, or counsel can make the argument that if there was no argument of, of reasonableness of the plan, you can't just bring that up first time in, in the, the appeal. It happens all the time, but this case gives you some kind of argument that that's not where the proper appeal lies. Um, this was originally a dirty house case. Um, the parties all agreed at the time of termination the house was fine. It was that the parents had not complied with the other uh, causes of the dirty house. Um, thus the leading to the termination. They filed under six and seven, um, and the court affirmed the termination um, and said, you know, first that they didn't correct the conditions that led to the dirty house, um, but also second, this is too late to be saying that the plan was not sufficient. You should have raised that a long time ago. Don't bother us with that now. What I see coming up in future issues are um, grounds for terminations or grounds for um, arguing that reasonable efforts have not been made. First one is the whole service coordinator section and this new model that we have of privatization. 
Um, I think that's going to leave all sorts of interesting questions about whether or not the service coordinator, if they don't provide reasonable efforts or they're less than stellar in the delivery of services, does that mean that the department failed to make reasonable efforts? Uh, Lancaster County is also having a series uh, where defense counsel is filing motions asking for a finding of no reasonable efforts, especially when there is not payment for services for parents. Um, I know it's different across the state for how services get paid for, either for drug treatment or for mental health. Um, current language in Lancaster is the department shall pay if there's no other source available, such as private insurance, Medicaid, or parents' own income. Um, that's not true across the state that the department has been required to make those payments, but that is something that's happening over in the eastern end. Uh, when services are not getting paid for or there's a delay in providing services, defense counsel's first action is to file a motion for no reasonable efforts. Um, there's some cases where that's affirmed. There's some cases where, you know, by the time we get to hearing on that issue, uh, which may be a review, may be earlier, uh, the issue is resolved and it becomes kind of kind of a moot point. Um, also interesting is going to be uh, whether or not there's any services available in the area. And this is, I would see, coming out of the Western service area where um, services are kind of spotty, that sometimes you'll have a great program, then suddenly funding will cut and there's no program there anymore, or there's a clear need, for instance, domestic violence uh, training or counseling for men or for the women, and there's just not the services available in the area. Um, that I could see as, as reasonable grounds to come up and, and say that there's no reasonable efforts from the department. Now, I, I don't think that it's going to be successful to say the department did not create a, cr a proper service. However, if there's no service available, how is the parent to rehabilitate? Was the plan reasonable? Um, so I see those as the, the future areas that's coming up. Um, and we can do, we're going to open up for questions in a little bit, and then um, if there's anything else that people want to discuss or that they want to see as reasonable efforts or want to talk about, we'd be happy to do that. We're also happy not to record that part if you don't want that part discussed. Um, also for the recording part, that's the little beeping that you hear in the background. Um, that's also my understanding is it's going to be available to the judges at this point, not necessarily available to all attorneys or the general public. Um, it's just more of a, if you could not sign on, that you'd have this training still available to you. Um, that's the, the gist of the presentation. Um, we. Uh, talked about having all these cases that we talked about and the 30 cases that Pat analyzed available to you. If you're interested in having that, just contact either Sarah or I or Melissa or Kelly by email or whatever other means, and we'd be happy to put together some kind of either flash drive or a zip or something, something technologically cool that we can send to you so you can have those cases pulled already for you so you can review them at your leisure. Um, I think we're going to unmute it and then open it up for questions.